everybody's favorite animal, western animal, is, is the icon of the West. But for me, a mule deer truly is the icon of the West. I mean, I can go to bed at night and I can go to sleep and that image is still in my mind of those bucks. And I, I've probably killed bigger bucks than every one of them in that group. But at the time, it was like I was just looking at my destiny. Before you spend any money on equipment or outfitters or anything, do yourself a favor. Go to that Western Hunting and Conservation Expo and go to all the free seminars. You know, when you buy tires for your pickup, you want to put some meaty tires that are that are rated for that load. Well, you want boots that are rated for the load. You know, you want to look at hiking boots that are meant to support more than just your body weight. Being a lifetime member of the Mule Deer Foundation, being a lifetime lover of mule deer, it's, it's more about what can I do for a mule deer today than how can I get one on the ground. Find what you love and just go get good at what you like to do. Hey, this is Mark Smith, the Muley Slayer, and you're listening to Living Country in the City. Y'all ready for your dose of flyover state spirit? Straight from the concrete jungle? Well, put down your latte and pull on your boots. It's time for Living Country in the City. Hey, y'all, welcome to episode 89 of Living Country in the City. I am super excited to start off this year with an awesome episode for y'all. Really quick, just want to say a huge thank you to all my supporting listeners, as well as those of you that have been sharing the podcast. You've really been helping it grow. Also, a huge shout out to Sawyer Products. They have been huge supporters of the podcast for quite a while now. Would not be able to do what I do without their help. You know, if y'all are looking for those really simple but essential products for the backcountry, make sure y'all check out Sawyer Products. They are the top of the line in water filtration, insect repellent, sunscreen, and first aid. Make sure y'all give them a visit at Sawyer.com. All right, y'all, without further ado, I'm really excited to launch off the new year with this episode. I talked to the one and only Mark Muley Slayer Smith. We have a great time talking about mule deer and a little advice for life. So, hope you all enjoy this one. All right, y'all. Here we are. Episode 89 of Living Country in the City. I am here with Mr. Mark Smith, the Muley Slayer. Thank you so much for hopping on, man. Hey, man. I'm glad to be on here. Thanks, Sam. So, always like to start out with uh, just a little introduction of yourself, maybe uh, some of your background, how you got your start in hunting in the outdoors. Yeah, sure. No problem, man. Well, um, for your listeners out there, uh, that already know who I am, uh, or, or, you know, if they follow on social media and I'm sure we covered all this at the end, but yeah, I'm Muley Slayer one on Instagram, if you want to get more information. Uh, but yeah, my start was, uh, <laughs> I just grew up a little kid in the seventies. I was born in 1970, grew up in East Texas and, uh, followed my dad, my uncles and my cousins around squirrel hunting and, and uh, got into trapping fur trapping when it was, when there was still a market for, for fur, uh, learned to do that at a very early age hunting and fishing. And then, um, when I was like 13, I was 12 years old. I was 12. Uh, I went to a garage sale and bought Fred bear, a book by Fred bear called the archer's Bible and started reading that book. And then watching my oldest, uh, an older cousin that was really my dad's generation, but he's my cousin, Tommy Young. He was kind of like my big brother in a way. I watched him and he was, in, even in the 70s, he was coming out to Colorado bow hunting elk and stuff. And I just watched him and Larry Stokes, his partner. And man, those guys inspired me. And then they were always bow fishing when the sloughs would get up in the springtime. They were always shooting big buffalo and carp and gar. And I'm like, man, I just... This, it was just always seemed so adventurous. They were always doing stuff, and then um, it just and that's what inspired me. Just a little bitty kid. I'm talking tiny little kid. And and then when I was 13, I saved enough lawn mowing money to buy my first compound bow. One of my best friends, Sean Dennison, and I both in 1983, I think, bought our first compound bows. And since then, he and I, he's a PSC staff shooter now, big time 3D shooter, and all that. And all of his sons are. We came up through the ranks together, and he's we've been to, from Canada to Mexico hunting everything, and uh, he, you know you have to have somebody you do it with. So me and Sean Dennison, we we've been doing it for 35 years together, and then uh, along the way, um, I moved to the Four Corners of New Mexico through a work transfer in my mid 20s. Got into 3D shooting pretty heavily, and got sponsored by a shop, and 
just from there, it just started growing. I started writing for Eastman's where you could, you know, they would publish your, your hunting stories and then you would learn how to self edit. And I actually, I was pretty good in high school. So I actually could write a little bit and I started writing more. Then I started writing for uh, some nationally ranked magazines like bow hunter and bow hunt America and Eastman's and then um, kept shooting. I, started, I eventually moved on to the pro division. I was sponsored by Hoyt at the time, shooting in the pro division at ASA, IBOs, NFA events there in Colorado. And I'd moved to Colorado. When I moved to Colorado, I started uh, really turning on the jets on the, um, the high country stuff, started bow hunting mule deer and elk and antelope and everything I get tags for there in Colorado and the surrounding state. So for about 20 years, I lived in the West and, um, just really let my DIY spirit take me wherever it would go into all the Western states, whether I was shooting competitively or, or backpacking and, and doing backpack style hunts. And along the way, knocked down some really nice public land um, elk and mule deer and made a name for myself for being a, you know, a straight, a straight shooter and a, um, an integrity guy, you know, not, not cutting any corners, not poaching. I didn't kill the biggest bucks on the mountain, but I killed decent bucks and I did it all a hundred percent legitimate and built a reputation for myself. And, and then, uh, the writing finally turned into speaking engagements. I did the international sportsman's expos and I did the, um, I still do the Western hunting expo every year. This will be my ninth straight year of doing, uh, how to, seminars on DIY mule deer bow hunting and actually Robbie Denny and I are going to do one this year together be a panel type deal on Saturday the big event there so I'm looking forward to that but that's me in a nutshell I just I'm a DIY blue collar guy um, I have a white collar job now I'm in upper management for a big uh, a big outfit here in Dallas Texas but I still treat my hunting uh, DIY because I just I just love that that sense of putting on a pack, going out on public land, doing it myself. And, uh, you know, all my hunting here in Texas is still low fence, you know, bottom land, river bottom hunting in East Texas. It's not the biggest bucks or the most bucks, but rarely am I on a corn feeder or any kind of a, and never behind a, t a high fence. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It just doesn't fit my style. So in a nutshell, that's kind of where I come from and where I'm at now. No, that's great. And, you know, with a for to have a uh, an Instagram handle like Muley Slayer, you definitely I think have the background to back that up, you know. And you're you're talking to a guy who who just got his filled his first tag, uh, his first big game animal, and um, you know I did it in uh, down in Arizona on that over the counter archery tag this year, um, and you know it was uh, it was really exciting to take my first Muley. Um, and you know, I I love that tag, especially because coming up, uh, I know a lot of people are working on it uh, this month, but then coming up in January, it's time to head back to Arizona to start chasing some more mule deer. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a great opportunity. One of the last DIY or one of the last OTC over the counter opportunities in the West for mule deer. And it's, it's, uh, it, you just got one there, and my hat's off to you, man, because that was that is my nemesis. That is the top of my bucket list is to notch an Arizona tag on an over-the-counter uh, mule deer hunt, and I've tried just shy of a dozen times, and I can't get it done. Now, I'm not saying I couldn't have shot smaller bucks, and I'm not a trophy hunter by any means, but I'm trying to shoot a mature deer, and I have I have cut hairs and I've had feathers go across their backs and across their briskets, but it's like the deer, the over counter, the, the over the counter deer in Arizona have a bubble around them and I can't figure out how to pop it. The <laughs> javelinas I got, <laughs> that's no problem. That's awesome. But, uh, I go in spurts where it gets to the top of my bucket list again and I'll go two or three winners in a row and try and, uh, come back very humbled. And then I get like, a PTSD and I'm like I'm never doing that again they just kick my butt too hard <laughs> then I'll get a hankering and I'll go back for a couple of years and I'll come back and but I'm still so my hat's off to you if you got it done on, on an over-the-counter hunt there I can't or just haven't been able to yet but I really 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 want to bad <laughs> it's a tough hunt man well I'll tell you it was it was definitely tough I um I did not think I honestly had gotten to the point where I did not think it was going to happen you know I same kind of situation where I was 
I was expecting to see hair on the on the fletchings uh, when I went to pick them up, but uh, yeah, we uh, finally got it done last day and um, was was really really happy about that. But um, talking about muleys, what is it about mule deer that that draws you so much? <clears throat> Man, I get asked that a lot. <laughs> you know why? why not elk or why not whitetail things you can call to and, and stuff when I think it's because you can't call them. Well, there's people that say you can rattle them or you can grunt them, but I'm telling you grunting and rattling mule deer. I've had zero success at that. And I've rattled in and killed a lot of whitetails and grunted in a lot of whitetails and bugled in and cow called in a lot of elk and decoyed antelopes and killed them. But mule deer, I think the draw is uh, for me, you know, a lot. Everybody's favorite animal, Western animal, is is the icon of the West. But for me, a mule deer truly is the icon of the West. And um, almost like from Joe Dirt, you know, why is sky good? Why are boobs good? I don't know. It just is, man. It's just <laughs> mule deer are just awesome. You know, they're like uh, they're just they're just awesome, and and they're so unique. I mean they're kind of i've seen a lot of mule deer that have a lot of similarities to whitetail and, and they look a lot like a black tail but mule deer are just mule deer there's nothing else like them on the planet anywhere and there's really no subspecies you know it's just a mule deer there's rocky mountain mule deer and desert mule deer and that's pretty much it you know depending on what part of the, their habitat you're in and um they uh i got inspired when i was 24 years old i living in El Paso, Texas. I've told this story a million times, but you know, let me, I'll give you the short version of it was I wanted to go hunting and the closest place to go hunting was over in New Mexico. It wasn't actually back over into Texas because it's El Paso, Texas is out on an island. I mean, you're so far from anything in Texas that, and it's all private. I didn't know anyone. So uh, I discovered that I could go to the national forest and go hunting in, in New Mexico a lot closer than I could go over into Texas. So I, I talked to my brother-in-law and my buddy, Sean, and the, hey, let's go to New Mexico mule deer hunting. We paid some old outfitter that, you know, he saw us coming a mile away. <laughs> we, we bought into it. Bottom line is we spent a weekend. We paid $150 each. And uh, I think we paid $150 a day to basically ride around on ice chest in the back of the truck, all but knocked arrows. And then we saw a quarter <laughs> horn. We were instructed to shoot it because that might be the only buck we saw. We did that for a weekend. And I went, man, you know, we can do this ourselves. This is this is cool, but I started doing my research and realized this is all national forest. I can go buy a license. I can camp and I can just go do it all that I want. And then by the next year, by the grace of the good Lord, I was living in farm, uh, Aztec, New Mexico, up in the four corners, which is in the Mecca of mega mule deer country. And so in 1995, I saw 94 was the first time I ever hunted them. Well, that summer, what inspired me was that summer, the old guy that we, we out the outfitter that, that got us to come hunt with him. He took us for a ride in what is now uh, unit 15. It, it was 15 a back then one of the premier Gila elk units in New Mexico um, up by Apache junction by the airstrip there. We went bouncing down this two track road in a little blue CJ seven. And these five, we saw more three, it was in August, you know, getting ready for the hunt. And, we saw some humongous bull elk. And back then, mule deer was going to be our caveat into being elk hunters. You know, ultimately, we're going to want to go elk hunting, so let's get our feet wet by going mule deer hunting. And we can just go buy over-the-counter tags with our bows, and we can just go do it, you know. And so we're bouncing down this little old logging road in the Gila National Forest in 1994, and these five big mature mule deer bucks come bouncing out of this little creek bed across the bar ditch, across the road, run up on the other side of the hill, across the road. They're 50 yards from us, broadsides, looking at the Jeep. And it sparked it, it, <laughs> that, that, that image of those bucks, skyline standing there. To me, you know, they were all probably just nice bucks. You know, I don't even know what, I wouldn't even say score, but they were just big deer compared to what I'd ever seen. But to me, it looked like the Magnificent Sevens, that picture of those bucks standing up there. I'm just like, oh my heavens, <laughs> this is, this is, I mean, I can go to bed at night and I can go to sleep and that image is still in my mind of those bucks. And I, I've probably killed bigger bucks than every one of them in that group. But at the time, it was like I was just looking at my destiny. You know, I tell people, it was, I was just, when I seen those five bucks, something changed in me that day forever. And since then, 
I love, man, I really, really love hunting hardwood bottoms for whitetails, uh, archery hunting in October. Man, I, hunting scrapes, that's one of my favorite things to do. And when the elk are fired up, man, that's, I love it when they're bugling. But mule deer, I don't care if they're in velvet or if they're in the rut or if it's in December, if it's January, if it's October with a rifle, or if it's August, I don't, none of that, none of that matters. You know, I don't, I have way more velvet bucks than I do hard at, antler bucks only number one i don't like cold weather too much i don't like being cold i don't i definitely don't want to go hunting in the snow and i don't i used to be like a macho man in my 20s and 30s i'd never say that but at 48 i'm gonna tell you right now if i gotta put on much more than a, a hoodie i ain't gonna go i just don't want to be that cold and wind wind blown <laughs> that's supposed to be fun the one thing i'll tell everybody is hunting is supposed to be fun and when it's no longer fun and you're miserable and cold even if you kill a giant buck, but you're, you know, miserable 99% of the time, well, you know, when you kill a big buck, yeah, that's pretty, it's worth it. But, you know, to go say, Hey, I'm going to go tromp around in the Wasatch in November and knee deep in snow. And I've done that before hoping to find a big buck, man. I, I think I'd just rather just sit at home and watch college football or something <laughs> and go do that. But Hey, send me back to the Wasatch in August. And man, I thrive. If I can just go up there in a t-shirt and turn on the jets and just climb all those peaks and chase muleys in t-shirt weather, man, that's, that's heaven on earth for me. So, oh <laughs> man, I just, I love them and I love every season and they just do something for me that other game animals don't do for me. And I don't, I don't know how to explain it any other way. So now, uh, you don't seem to discriminate too much, but do you have a preference as far as, uh, hunting them with a, a bow or a rifle or muzzle loader? No, I've 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 done it all. I, I've hunted muzzleloader the least, but I've been 100% successful with muzzleloader tags. Um, but a little backstory: growing up in Texas, October meant bow season, and we had a very liberal back then, and still do now. We have a liberal hunting season here in Texas, so archery starts the first weekend in October, last weekend of September, somewhere around the 28th of September till around October 1st. At least by October 1st, bow season is going to start, archery season. And then, that, then you can archery hunt until the first Saturday in November. And then from there until the middle of January, you can hunt whatever you want. Or the first week of January, you can hunt with whatever you want. And then in January, the first, I think around the 5th of January till about the 15th, that's when we have a muzzleloader only season. I never got into muzzleloaders until I moved out west when they had specific seasons for it. But what October always meant, I'm going to get my bow out I'm going to, in August. I'm going to dust it off, put fresh broadheads in, and I'm going to go get in trees, and I'm going to shoot anything I see with my bow and arrow. <laughs> but the instant the first weekend of November comes, I won't touch my bow again until next August. I'm going to rifle hunt and, and fill all my tags in November, December. And that's just the way I was in Texas. That's just how – Almost everybody is in Texas. But when you move out west and you have to specify, do I want to hunt deer or elk? Or do I want to hunt, if I want to hunt deer and elk, uh, I got to pick a date, I got to pick a season, I got to pick a weapon. But you can't just start hunting. And so I think maybe Idaho, maybe you can. I, I, don't, I don't really understand all of the states. Maybe Wyoming has some mixture. But for me, in New Mexico and in Colorado, where I live, and, and in Utah, uh, where I hunted a lot, you, you, you had to pick a season you pick a species and pick a weapon choice. And then that was it. That's what you, that's what you hunted. Well, I realized I wanted to hunt more than I wanted to kill. I mean, I'm, I want to be successful, but I want the opportunity to hunt. Bow tags were always easier. And, um, and, and you were there, you could just get tags much easier. Most of them were over the counter back then when I first started and it was in a nice time of the year. And what I would do is I'd split it up. You know, I'd get my, I'd get a, a tag in New Mexico, a, a tag in Colorado. There were times when I had a tag for all four of the four corner states plus the Navajo Indian Reservation, which is really just a DIY national forest hunt. It's on Indian land, but it's it's still just a, a DIY hunt. Mm -hmm. When you're doing archery or in the general season, you just go hunt it. So um, there were times I'd have five deer tags in my pocket in the month of September. And that's if I was archery hunting and they were all affordable, you know, under $200 back then. So I would save my New Mexico tag because back then you could get it in September and hunt. If you didn't harvest, then you could hunt that January. Whereas in, August, whereas in Arizona, it's kind of backwards. If you get it in January, then you can hunt August and then again in December. But in, in New Mexico, if you got it in September, 
you could save that tag for the January bow hunt. And that's what I learned how to do early on. So I would go hit Colorado and Utah and the Navajo in the early season and then save my other tag and then hunt January um, in New Mexico and split it up. So I preferred bow hunting because of opportunity to hunt. And if you're only going to bow hunt and you commit to bow hunting, that's what drove me to start shooting the 3Ds more seriously because I wanted to be absolutely, you know, I ran into this guy named Randy Ulmer at a shoot 25 <laughs> years ago. almost, And I'm like, I want to I be like that guy. And, and he was my idol at archery for the longest time. Now we're friends. You know, we've been friends with him for a long, long time. And we've shared hunting information and I've done favors for him. He's done favors for me. And we're, we're cool like that. I'm still a fan, but he's my friend, but I watched what he was doing. I'm like, you don't ever touch a gun. He's 100% committed to archery hunting and he's highly successful and he's highly successful on the tournament trail. So I emulated that. And then I realized, yeah, if you're going to be, and there, a lot of the really good bow hunters that I know, the great bow hunters are committed to archery only. But when I moved back to Texas and I didn't hardly touch guns, I didn't hardly touch guns very much, not because I didn't enjoy it. I just had gotten in this, um, I just had really developed into this bow guy. And, and that's what my passion was when I was doing, but I came back home to my home state of Texas and started laying down animals with the rifles again. And really my passion for reloading and shooting centerfire rifles fired back up. And then I befriended Adam Weatherby and I've been a fan of Weatherby since I knew how to spell Weatherby back in my teenage years. And, uh, got on a program with those guys. It's not really a sponsorship. It's a partnership. And, and I can, I can pretty much handle any of their guns I want for as long as I want. And I can get a few of them here and there, but I've got a great relationship with a, a company that I truly believe in with awesome people at the helm. And, uh, you know, he's a third generation Weatherby running it over there. And so in recent years, if you see a lot of my posts, man, I'm shooting a Weatherby and it's, and it's because I believe in them. I believe in the people and they're good people. And, um, I love that too. I love, I, I, I equally love hunting mule deer in certain areas with rifles as much as I love hunting them with a bow and arrow, but it's gotta be like just a few hunts. If I'm going to go to a new state, 90, 99% of the time, if I'm going to go to a new state or I'm going to go somewhere new and go hunt mule deer, try something new, it's going to be in the early bow season. If I ever go to Idaho, it's probably going to be in September with a bow. If I go to Wyoming, it's going to be in September with a bow and arrow. But that's one of the states that I think, you know, if you go to the 15th and you don't get your big buck, then you can go pick up that weather and go back up there and <laughs> mow him down on <laughs> September the 16th, which I think is, I think that's awesome if I ever get oh, that yeah. chance. But anyway, that's, that's, I, I prefer, I, anymore, I can't say I prefer one over the other, but I'm known as a bow hunter. I'm passionate about bow hunting. I love it. But I just I equally love some of the mule deer hunts I do with a rifle just as much, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, that's man. There's so many, so many incredible opportunities out there. Um, I mean, you could pretty much be hunting every day of the year if you if you were to <laughs> uh, really. Uh, oh yeah. Really time it out right. I mean. Um, yeah, you got all kinds of people like Randy Newberg who are out there, uh, out there in the field. Uh, probably, and I'm pretty sure about three quarters of the year, and uh, yeah, home very, very rarely. But um, so for someone that wants to start, you know, they're listening to this and they're saying, "Okay, I'm sold. This is what I want to do. I want to chase mule deer." Where you know, I mean. Other, obviously, than the basics, you know, getting your hunting license and your tags and stuff, uh, you know, where does, where does someone start? What would you, what would you tell someone if they're like, okay, you know, I got my hunting license, um, you know, I'm, I'm putting in for mule deer tags. What should, what should I do now? I want to, I want to go find myself a mule deer. <laughs> yeah. Well, for a long, long time, I would get very specific about telling you how to go about doing all, all of that stuff on your own. But the older I get and the more, the more I see, uh, you know, I, I watch other folks struggle with it or whatever. Uh, I, I would say this, if you can, and not everyone can. I, when I first started, 
I actually did what my advice is. You know, a lot of people say, do as I say, don't do as I do. But I, I actually didn't know anything, and I just wanted to go, and I went with an outfitter. And it was not the best experience, but it inspired me. Nothing motivates me more than failure. I mean, I mean, you feel, uh, if I go and have a little bit of success at something, I go, eh, it was cool. But if I go somewhere and I'm defeated, man, I am hell-bent on success at that very unit or that mountain, maybe that basin or that species or whatever I fail at, I'm not going to stop till I'm, I go and I'm successful at it. That's, that's why I've been back to Arizona so many times. <laughs> and I'm still trying. But what I would say to someone is take the macho ego part of it out of the equation. Forget all that stuff. For DIY is a tagline that we've come up with to make us feel good about ourselves because we go do it on our own. And that's awesome. When you're, when you can go do it on your own and you have all the ability and the know-how and everything to go do it on your own, that's great. Do it on your own. But if you're sitting in Minnesota right now, listen to this, or if you're in Florida or North Carolina or, you know, a great bow hunting state like Pennsylvania, you're sitting there and you're going, man, I want to go do what Mark's talking about. I want to put on a backpack and I want to go up a mountain and kill a buck. But you live two days ride from mule deer country in a truck or, you know, six hours on a jet plane from mule deer country. And the odds are you're not going to go scout. You're just going to go out and hunt one week a year. You're going to try. I, I say the first thing, the first year, and you're going to need a backpack and stove and you're going to need, you know, if you're going to do a backpack style mountain hunt, you're going to need all of the specialized gear that's going to set you back a big chunk of money. And you may not even like mule deer hunting. You may not, you may say this was more physically demanding than what I expected or whatever. My, my advice is if you can save enough money to buy all of that gear, don't. <laughs> Take that money and go with a reputable outfitter and go learn mule deer. Don't don't worry. They're going to show you how to strap on your pack, just like they're going to show you how to saddle up the horse and maybe do a horseback hunt where they ride you in. Those mule deer bow hunts in the early season are really affordable. Anywhere you go in good mule deer country, and I don't have any outfitter friends doing it, so I'm not going to. Rec- I'm not telling them this because I'm going to help put some change in my friend's pocket. I'm saying if I was Mark Smith and I'm 24 years old and I've never been before. I would still do that, knowing everything that I know, or knowing, knowing what I know now, I would tell myself at 24 years old, even if that means you can't go the first year you want to go, keep saving your pennies and hire somebody that's reputable, call references, make dang sure that you jive with these people and go on a fully guided outfitted or maybe a semi-guided drop camp or something. Let them take you into mule deer country so that you can go learn how to find mule deer because you could come out from out west you could come out west and spend your whole first week and maybe on the seventh day of an eight-day hunt finally see a mule deer and you just spend you know that learning curve that you're going to get from somebody or, or or even socializing you know networking with people on the internet if there's a guy maybe you've got a thousand acres on a great farm in wisconsin and man you you could set a guy up to kill a nice white tail no matter what Get to know this person. You meet somebody on Facebook or Instagram and say, hey, do you want to trade? I'm sincere. I've been following you for six months. You seem like a straight guy. I like you a lot. You seem like a, it's just a straight shooter. Have you ever wanted to hunt whitetails in Wisconsin? Yeah, man, I'd love to kill one of those big old bucks in November in the rut. Well, I'd love to kill a velvet mule deer out there in your home state of Idaho. Maybe we could do a trade. I've done this. Some of them have not been very successful. Some of them have been terrible experiences, but some of them I met John Yokely that way. And I've never traded to John where I brought him to Texas or Colorado. I, I, I helped him get on an antelope hunt through another friend of ours, but John has graciously opened his home up to me and I've come and killed antelope or um, javelinas with him. And I've tried to hunt mule deer and I just can't hit them. But John always seems to find them for me. But we created this great friendship. That's that's another way of doing it is by networking, socializing, and having a solid trade. You know, treat your guests like you're an outfitter and you truly want them to be successful. And if they treat you like a guest and they want you to be, but you can show each other the ropes, I think that's a great way of doing it. Just really do your homework and get to know that person. But the number one safest way is probably say, hey, man, just hire a reputable outfitter. 
get into mule deer country and start learning them, figure out what gear you liked and didn't like about it, the boots, the packs, the sleeping pad, the stoves, learn the ropes on that, and then go, now I've been, I love it, it's my passion, start saving your money and get the gear just a little piece at a time. And you don't have to have the very best stuff from the beginning. You can start off with, like I did, with a pack from Goodwill. You know, I started off with a frame, an old Coleman frame pack from Goodwill. And man, I, I've hauled a lot of bucks out on that thing. It worked <laughs> great. But you don't have to have a brand new Badlands, but eventually you get a Badlands pack or whatever you like. But that's my advice to people that have never done it. Do it right the first time, just like buying a bow. I've, I, I, it took me forever to get proficient or even understand a bow. And I've been, I'd been shooting one for 10 years. I bought my bow at a sporting goods store, read books, bought a site, bought this, bought that, played with things. And then finally, I was like 23 years old and I, before I ever went to a bow shop and said, I want to buy a bow from a bow shop and be fitted. Man, my first 10 years, I realized the first 10 minutes with a pro – at a bow shop, setting my, me up voided out the first 10 years. You know, the first 10 minutes voided out the first 10 years of trying to figure this crap out on my own. So I tell people now, don't don't go to the box store and buy your bow uh, and, 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 and try to figure it out. Man, go to a reputable shop. You're going to spend a little bit more for your equipment, but you're going to end up getting that service. And the service and the schooling and the teaching that comes along from those folks that set you up properly in the beginning – is going to pay off that you may pay a little more up front, but it pays for itself in the end. Same thing. If you start mule deer hunting or elk hunting or whatever, go with somebody, let them show you the ropes, or it's just going to be a long learning curve. Now, if you're hard headed, you're DIY, you know, it all, you don't want to listen to me. That's fine. Go get your stuff, do your research, you know, and, and just go. And, and, and if you're, if you're a good savvy hunter, you're probably going to figure it out really quick and you're going to have a good time and you're, and you're going to figure it out. But there's a lot of people out there that just, they just don't want to quite put that first foot out the door and go because they just don't know what direction to go. It's okay. Put the ego down. Put the DIY down. Don't worry about it. Go ask. Ask the questions. Hire somebody and go. But if you do go, just say, hey, man, what would this outfitter uh, – Wolf Creek Adventures in Southern Colorado was amazing. And then my guy, Jerry, got me on this buck and I killed him and just call a spade a spade. It is what it is. But you're going to learn enough from Jerry that the next year you can go do that pretty much by yourself. And that's that's my advice to someone wanting to get into it. On that note, let's take a quick moment to hear a word from one of my partners. All right, y'all, I'm not afraid to admit that I'm a huge geek when it comes to games. And well, let's face it, a lot of other things, too. However, when it comes to nerdy card and board games, I really can't get enough. So when I found out there was a card game out there combining two of my passions, hunting and nerdy adventure games, I really had to pick it up. The game is called Gut Pile, and the goal is to build the ultimate Alaskan hunt. You do so by collecting several cards, including animals such as grizzly bear and moose, hunting locations like Yonder Mountain and Nunya Creek, as well as weaponry, gear, and transportation. But make sure you've got tags or donuts handy because you never know when an Alaskan state trooper will drop in unannounced. It's a great game and a ton of fun for hunters who are inspired to share stories about their past hunts as well as non-hunters who can be brought into discussions about hunting in a very non-threatening way. If you'd like to learn more, check out my podcast with the guys at Gut Pile Games by visiting livingcountryinthecity.com slash 22 and get $5 off your order from Gut Pile Games by visiting our partners page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash partners. All right, we are back. Um, so, you know, we talked uh, a little bit about, um, you know, you talked about going with an outfitter uh, as, as being a good option to start. Um, you know, I think that could also apply to even just, you know, if you've got buddies that are going out, um, you know, maybe... It, if, if they've got earlier tags than you do, you know, maybe you've got a rifle tag, they've got archery tags. I, you know, I don't know of many, many guys, many buddies that would be willing to turn down a, uh, an extra back to help pack out some meat or someone to help set up camp in exchange for, you know, letting you come along and learn from them. Uh, you know, obviously some people might be a little more cautious to give away their spot that they're going hunting, but, um, you know, finding other people that are, are more experienced than you is definitely an important 
important piece for sure. Yeah. And making sure it's somebody, making sure it's somebody you jive with, you know, uh, that's a big thing that I talk about in seminars too. When we're talking about like the style of hunting that I do, the backpack style hunting, the backcountry style hunting, if you're going to go isolate yourself on a mountaintop with someone 10 miles from the truck, five miles from the truck for 10 days, make sure it's somebody that you have the somewhat same core beliefs and values, uh, or you can get pretty miserable pretty quick. I've ran into that. So, you know, I just jumped in feet first with somebody I didn't really know. And then after like the second day, I'm like, man, you're, you're a solid dude, but I, I cannot stay on this mountain one more day with you. I'm sorry. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe they felt the same way about me, but I'm, I'm just the kind of guy like, I'm not, I'm not going to be a victim of my circumstances ever. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm not miserable for the next seven or eight days. I'm here. This is my vacation. I'm here to hunt. I'm going to get a buck. I got to go. And you got to be able to say that. But now when I'm interviewing someone to hunt with, I had to hunt with very many different people. I just don't. I've, I've been doing it a long time. I've got my core buddies that I hunt with. I'm not saying I wouldn't hunt with you or anybody, but I would make sure we at least are on the same page in our values, our family values, maybe our religion. It, close. You know, I'm just, I'm just a good old Baptist boy, but most of my friends are Mormons because <laughs> they're all from Utah and we all get along great. And we have the same, our religions are different, but our core values are exactly the same. And so I can get on a mountain with those guys and mix it up for 10 days. And we never bat an eye. But if you get somebody really far from that, it's really, really far from where you are at you, when you're walk with the Lord, you get on a mountain, man, it, you're both going to get super irritated really fast. And that's what happened to me. So if you're, if you're thinking about going with a buddy or somebody you've met by social network or something, just make sure you, you ask the right question and, and really get to know them because that could turn into a really, really bad situation. And that's, that's not a popular topic, but it is something people really need to think about. No, absolutely. And, you know, there's often the opportunity to, you know, meet these people at at events. And, uh, you know, you don't have to just pick someone randomly off the Internet and, you know, take the take the time to get to know someone before you're out in the backcountry, very, very deep, very, very alone with weapons. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Absolutely. You know, some of my best hunting partners our uh, team backcountry, they're, they're actually some of my very best friends, but they're my hunting partners. Now, one of the, one of the few people that I actually will go on backcountry hunts with for extended stays. And we've hunted the backcountry of Nevada and Colorado and Utah together. And uh, I met all of those boys right there in Salt Lake at the Western Hunt Expo. It all started right there. And, uh, and now I've got a pile of friendships that have come through my speaking engagements at those things. So that's a, if you're a Western, if, if you're, I'll just, I'll give a plug to the expo and you've, you've been there. So, you know, oh, yeah. if you're even thinking you want to get into Western hunting or to learn mule deer, elk or whatever, I probably should have said that first before you spend any money on equipment or outfitters or anything, do yourself a favor, book a couple of nights in Utah, jump on an airplane, fly to Salt Lake. It's that simple get you a hotel just down the road from the salt palace and go to that Western hunting and conservation expo and go to all the free seminars. Oh, I'm yeah. going to be there. Team Backcountry is going to be there. Robbie Denning's going to be there. Corey Jacobson's always there doing elk stuff and some of the best in the business and they're free. You pay the admission 20 bucks to come in the door, walk the floor, meet the outfitters, look at all the bows, the guns, the scopes, the clothing. You get fitted for packs from Badlands, Kuyu, Sitka. All of those brands are there. They have representatives to fit you with packs, talk to you about the sleeping bags, the pads. Go, you know, Get in on all the tags. Maybe you get yourself a, a stinking book cliffs deer tag on the best deer hunt in the West or a, a Henry's tag or a – you know, an elk tag or something, you, you know, those $5 tags. So I really want to stress that that's, that's a little bit of money to spend to fly there, but I've never known anyone that went to the expo and said, man, I'll never do that again. They're like, I cannot wait till February because I'm going back to the expo. That is the Mecca of Western hunting for me. I mean, it's just a good time. This is like my wife and I go, this is our, this will be our ninth straight year. I believe that we've gone to that and do seminars. So Man, I, I really, I really can't stress that enough. Are you going to be there again this year? I'm, I'm 
really hoping to. Uh, that's that's the goal. Unless unless something unforeseen happens, I will I will be there. I've got I've got a February uh, New Mexico Audad hunt uh, that's that might be putting a kink in plans. But I think uh, I think the plan is to go out to Hunt Expo and then just drive straight down to New Mexico after that. So we will awesome. we will see for sure. That'd be great. But yeah, I, uh, I'd like to meet you there. That'd be awesome. No, that would be great. I had a I had an amazing time last there. Hammered out last year. I had a hammered out a ton of podcasts and um, hung out hung out with that Dustin Whitwer guy, a team back country for a little bit. I don't know about him though. I you know you're talking about him. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. Well, as long as he doesn't have that mustache, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Uh, yeah, I give them heck about that all the time. They're crazy. They're crazy, crazy good though. They're good and they're good guys. Yeah, and Corey. I, no, I love I did love you, Dustin. Did Corey you just either. meet Dustin or did you meet all of them? Uh, I've met I've met all of them. Um, I, I've had Dustin on the podcast though. Um, we had a we had a really good chat. Um, and uh, yeah, I've I've run into him a few times at, at a Total Archery Challenge and uh, at the at some various expos and events and stuff. So. Gotcha. But, uh, <laughs> no, they're good guys. And the, I mean, the nice thing about expos too, you know, you talk about uh, looking for guided hunts and if you do want to invest in gear, I mean, you're not going to find better deals anywhere. Mm-mm. I mean, you know, there's, no. there's the deals I walk by, you know, are just insane every time. And I, it's very hard to not spend a couple of paychecks there. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. So what, what would you recommend for a guy that's getting started, um, you know, even going with an outfitter, obviously there's some, you know, basic gear that you're going to need to get. Um, you know, and I, I think I've probably covered this in some other podcasts, but I'd like to get your your perspective on what what would be the important important gear for a new mule deer hunter to invest in. Maybe, you know, uh, the stuff, if he's going to spend a little bit of extra money, what should he be spending that extra money on, do you think? Sure, absolutely. It, the things, whether you go with an outfitter or not, the thing, the core things you're going to need are quality glass. And, and I'll say the cliche, the best you can afford, or just you, even if you're a whitetail hunter back East, you need to have a good pair of 1042s, a minimum of 842s, you know, but 1042s. I'm, I'm a Vortex guy. I like the Vortex glass, but Leupold also makes great ones. You don't have to have Swarovski or Leica or Zeiss, but if you can afford it, get those. But if you can't, man, get into a good pair of Vipers. Some Viper HDs are great, 1042s. I have Razors, 12 by 50s. I got Razor 1042s, but I love my little Viper HD 1042s. I was going to throw them, you know, just be on the dashboard type binoculars, but I, I, they're so lightweight and they work so good. And I think they're under 600 bucks and they're just like awesome binoculars. I I love them. So I'd say number one, have you some good glass and and equally as important. The two main things is binoculars, you know, glass and boots. Boots are by far the one thing that I I really stress to guys. Do not, don't, don't cheap out on your footwear because your feet are doing all of the work. 100% your eyeballs and your feet are doing all the work. So get and I'm not talking about just go to the local box store and buy the best brand of hunting boots they have. I mean, get fitted, go with something, a lace to the toe design. Uh, I, I've always, uh, man, for the last 15 years, put a lot of emphasis into footwear and I use custom footbeds that I have, you know, I'm talking $250 footbeds that are form fitted to my feet by professional sports athletic folks at sports shops that do fitting for skis for athletes and for basketball players and stuff like that. But that's just an investment. I don't, I'm not saying you have to do that, but I do do that. And boots. Um, I was a Loba guy for quite some time, but speaking of team backcountry, my friend Corey, he's over there at crispy now. And uh, he just hooked me up and I'm pretty proud of him. I got a pair of Nevada uninsulated. I got them on my feet right now and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sponsored or nothing, but it's, uh, they, they have a outdoor influencer program that I got on. And so I probably ought to plug them a little bit, but I haven't been in the back country in them, but I'm telling you, I've worn them all day. And it's like wearing a pair of Nikes and a free box, man. They're freaking awesome. They're lightweight. 
and I love them. And they have the lace to toe design, and that's important for a custom fit. But you need to get your feet aligned underneath your body. The, um, you need to have good traction, ankle support, because your feet on a western backcountry hunt, or any, I don't care if it's a western hunt, you're going out in an alfalfa field. If you're hiking ridges and stuff in glass, and you're not even gaining any altitude, you got to have good footwear. You don't want to be out there in sneakers. Uh, you want to have good foot protection, and 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 you want to carry a load. And I tell people, you know, when you're backpacking, backpack style hunts, you know, when you buy tires for your pickup. You, you, you have to match the tire to the task. You know, you don't put mm-hmm. little street tires on that, that are designed to carry just, you know, some, if you're going to haul a horse trailer loaded down with gear, you want to put some meaty tires that are, that are rated for that load. Well, you want boots that are rated for the load. You know, you want to look at hiking boots that have, that are meant to support more than just your body weight and ankle support. You know, you want tires that are going to carry the load and get extra traction when you're extra heavy. So make sure you do your research on boots and footwear. Like I said, I'm going to plug Krispies because that's what I have on and they're treating me right. And so far I love them. I can't wait to get them in the back country, but there's a lot of great boots out there, but boots and glass. And then um, don't skimp on your, on your pack, you know, get a good pack. I'm a bad lens guy. I've been for a long, 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 long time. And even if I wasn't partnered with them, I'd say that's a good, that's a good pack that anybody can afford. And, uh, you know, if you're going to go with, you're not going to backpack in, you're just going to ride a horse and stuff, man, I think a great pack for anybody is either the Badland Sacrifice or the uh, 2200. It's just a great all around pack that you can hunt a couple of days out of, and you can haul half of a deer out in one load with either one of those packs. Well, the, the Sacrifice, I think I could probably haul a whole deer out in one load. But in the 2200, I know for a fact I can carry half of a deer out uh, on those. And, um, and then all the way around on gear, as you, as you get more established in life and you have better paychecks and more income, or you start hitting bonuses and you're, you're getting middle-aged, uh, don't go with bargain basement gear, you know, especially with archery gear, you definitely get what you pay for. So go with higher end bows and arrows and broadheads and, uh, shoot, shoot good stuff. You know, don't, if you're going to put all that time and energy and effort into the hunt, just and it's your passion don't don't cheap out just you know get get good stuff and uh and and as you go though and you go and you things fail on you or you you'll learn the ropes you'll learn what you'll learn what laying that extra five ten fifteen dollars down at the counter means in the back country it might seem like you're saving yourself some coin at the counter when you're standing there at home in front of the wife knowing you should probably buy this other thing and then you get the back country you're like I'm a thousand percent more miserable than I have to be for 15 flipping dollars, man. I wish I'd have done this or even a hundred dollars. I wish I'd have done that, but you'll learn that as you go. But you asked me a very pointed specific question. What few things do I think are important? And I'm just going to go with your pack, your boots and your, and your glass. No, I mean, you, you make a very good point and it really comes down to, you know, what do you, what do you have more of, uh, you know, a willingness to push through crap uh, while you're in the backcountry or money. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, cause, cause you're sacrificing one or the other, you're either sacrificing your money or you're sacrificing your comfort. Um, and you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you can find a, a good balance in the middle of that. And you're, I gotta say you're preaching to the choir with those crispies, man. I, um, I, you know, also not sponsored by them at all, but I am just, a huge advocate of their, uh, of their boots. I've got a pair of the, uh, the Hunter GTX, the, the Gore-Tex insulated, the, the big monster boots. And then I've got, uh, on the full opposite end of the spectrum, I've got their Laponias, which are just, you know, super flexible and you can practically run in them. Um, mm. and I wear those things every day. Um, they have, I originally bought them for like light hikes and stuff. Um, I'll, I'll wear them out on, on mild hunts, you know, where I'm not doing a lot of, a lot of heavy hiking or heavy packing, but they've just absolutely, they're so comfortable. They've turned into my daily wear boot, um, just around, around town, around the, uh, you know, when I'm doing chores around the house, everything, they're fantastic boot, uh, great company, you know, and I, I've gotten to know a lot of the people that work there. I didn't realize Corey had moved over there. So that's really cool to hear. Yeah, he was at Shields forever, but he's over there. He, he's. I was going to go with Crispy. I even announced it on Instagram, I think, over a year ago. And then 
um, I just had an experience that didn't set right with me. And I was like, ah, I'm going to go a different route. And then Corey got over there, just dinged me one day and said, man, we just got to get you in a pair of these boots. We just got to get you turned around, man, let's, you know, to talk to the boss. Let's, let's hook you up. Let's just see where we, where this goes. And I'm like, okay, man. And so I went through and talked to him about the, the different ones and what fit my style. And man, I'm so glad that I listened because <laughs> these things are, they're incredible. These, these are the uninsulated Nevadas and, uh, I have them on right now and I wore them all day today to work and I wore them and I just, they're super, super cool to look at. <laughs> they make, I have really big feet but for some reason. These boots with, uh, these boots with boot cut jeans make my feet look kind of small. And I like that because they, otherwise I look like I got giant feet, but they look cool, but they're super comfortable and I've not, they're not sweaty at all. And, uh, I can't wait and I, I can't wait to, uh, to, uh, I've got a full winter. I'd love to say I was going to come out in Arizona and chase muleys around, but I'm not. I want to, but I got a, I got a, I got a pretty busy schedule the rest of the winter. But uh, man, I'm going to be somewhere in a t-shirt in August with my bow with these crispies on, tearing up a mountain somewhere. So there you yeah, go. Pretty stoked about it. Yeah, no, I got, I got my, my tag filled for this year. So my one deer for this year, and then uh, in January I've got Havelina, and I imagine. Um, you know, if a if a nice buck walks out, uh, I won't be too proud to draw on it because I'll I'll pick up that tag again for sure. But I'll be focusing on Havelina, so I don't know if uh, um, I don't know if I'll be filling the tag January or if I'll be back in uh, back in August December uh, to try and to try and fill that one. So did you did you just fill your tag in August? Yep. yep. The one you said you just filled was it an Arizona tag in August? Wow, man. That- Oh yeah. Pretty incredible. Little uh it was a little I think uh, it's incredible. Club spike. Um you know, I I could not have been happier with him. Uh, you know. It was just how it happened and everything. Um it was it was just amazing. You know, I did a I kind of did a little recap. I've only ever done two podcasts by myself and funny enough, they're as I'm both of them were done as I was driving out of Arizona. Uh different times of year, but uh yeah, this last one I did a, just a little recap and kind of rambled on about my thoughts about the um, about that hunt and and everything that happened. Um, it's a few back. I can't remember the number off my head, but uh, yeah, it was just you know it was just an, an amazing time and definitely um, cool animals and and I tell you what, that was a, a damn tasty deer, <laughs> um, you know. That's the one benefit about uh, not shooting a big, nasty, ruddy muley buck and shooting uh, something a little bit younger. Man, did he taste good. <laughs> hey, that's the most important thing, man. Oh, yeah. That's the number one reason. All the other stuff, the adventure, the horns, all that stuff, is for me, is always secondary, man. Putting that meat in the freezer is the number one reason I'm a hunter, and I will never... I'll never compromise that or, or belittle that part of it. So I'm glad to hear you say that. And and those younger ones are, they're, they're, uh, they're easier to pack out and they're exceptionally delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think we kind of touched on like one or two things, but, um, earlier, but, you know, you've been, you've been hunting mule deer for, uh, quite a while and, um, you know, if you looked back at yourself when you first started and you were kind of figuring stuff out, what things would you tell younger Mark, the the muley hunter? <laughs> mm, man, oh, there's a few things I've told myself <laughs> over the years. Uh, I have killed a lot of consolation bucks. Um, <laughs> what happens is you practice. You, and I, and a lot of guys I know have done this, man, there's called, they're called consolation bucks. What happens is you practice and you practice and you practice and you visualize all of this stuff in your mind, how the perfect stock's going to go down. You're going to bend your bow back, bury that pin in the pocket. You're going to execute the most perfect shot of your life. You're going to double lung the buck. You're going to start down the mountain, roll over. And it's going to be this this glorious, glorious thing, right? And you think about it 24, seven, 365. That's just what we think about. And then opening day comes, you hunt really hard, 
you start thinking, man, I'm never going to get it done. It's not, it's not even possible to kill a deer with a bow and arrow. Even though you've killed 10 or 15 of them, you're like, it's impossible. I, I can't even kill a deer with a bow and arrow. And finally, boom, the buck you want, the one you see pokes his head out and he steps out and you feel really good about it. And you draw, you bend that bow back and you bury that pin in the pocket and then you shoot. But you didn't account for the pine bow about halfway down to the deer and your arrow glances off. And the buck stops away stops at 150 yards, looks over his butt at you, thumbs his nose at you, and walks off into the willow patch. And then you make the next bend in the road or the next turn on the mountain, and there's a much lesser buck standing broadside at 45 yards feeding, and you feel like, I've got to kill him because I don't even know if I can still kill a mule deer, and you shoot him, and you make a perfect shot on him, and he flops over and he falls down dead, and then right behind him, 180-inch buck steps out or – my point is more times than not when I was younger, I would end my hunt on something. I would really, you know, I'm not, I'm not a trophy hunter, but I am trying to shoot mature deer. And I've always tried to shoot the biggest bucks on the mountain, but almost every time I killed a deer that was a lesser buck than what I really wanted was because I just missed a really buck. And I gave up on myself too quick and said, I got to kill a constellation buck. That's it. My big buck got away. And I got on our lease. A guy that we hunt with, um, Another hunter here in Texas, one of the other members of our club killed uh, the, his target buck, and I saw him do it. And he, he had several bucks coming into his area, but he had this one buck he wanted to kill. When the rut kicked off, that buck moved off of his area of, the, of where we're hunting over under this other guy's place, and the guy shot him. And it was a really big, you know, for East Texas, I mean, it was a 156-inch whitetail, and that is gigantic for where we hunt. And this thing was massive, and it was beautiful. But I've seen it deflate my other friend, the guy that had, had pictures of him all summer. He was just absolutely deflated. He was happy for the guy because the guy got in fair and square, but I've seen what it did to him internally. And, man, the very next set in his box blind, he, he just shot an average, just legal three-year-old eight-pointer, and he shot him, and he filled his tag. And I've never seen him do that, but I saw it. And I'm like, man, he's just, he's just going to shoot a consolation buck because he just feels like the wind was knocked out of him. So looking back over my career of bow hunting, I have shot a lot of bucks that were nice, that were bucks I really wanted. And I've ended my hunt on some bucks that really uh, just, that weren't what I wanted because I felt like I had to. So if I could go back and tell uh, Mark, a younger Mark, at some of those instances, I wish I could just put my hand on my shoulder after miss and say, there's nothing you can do about that. It's a bow hunting. You're going to miss. Stick to the plan. Stick to the plan. Stick to the plan. You know what buck you want to shoot. Stay after the one you want. Don't shoot anything. You know, when you're young, you want to put meat on the table and you're not wanting, you know, you want to be successful. And I always was, my focus was to be successful. I want to punch tags. I love punching tags. That's the only way to be successful. But uh, as I got older and more involved in conservation, you know, I'm a life member of the Mule Deer Foundation. And mule deer are, there are only the mule deer there are. You can't go anywhere else and get any. Whatever is from Mexico to Canada, that's it. Inside the lower 48, north to south, that's what there are. There's not mule deer anywhere else on the planet. They're not transplanted anywhere. And they're a shrinking opportunity. And they're a shrinking species. They're going down in numbers every year. Everywhere they are, they're not growing. And the opportunities get less. So with that said, I'm a lot. I'm either going to shoot one I really, really want, or I'm just going to go really learn how to enjoy and appreciate mule deer where they live. I'm just not going to shoot something that's not what I want. That was a hard lesson to learn. But I want to have mule deer for my children. I want to have grand, my grandchildren. I have six grandkids now. I want them to be mule deer. I want them to go have that experience in the Gila where those five bucks are on the hill. I want it to change their hearts and change their minds and, mis and, and inspire them like I was. So being a lifetime member of the Mule Deer Foundation, being a lifetime lover of mule deer, it's, it's more about what can I do for a mule deer today than, than what it is, how can I get one on the ground? And that's easy for me to say. I'm sitting in a room surrounded by a lot of great mule deer heads. And I've had my <laughs> share of them. But I would also tell my younger self that, hey, you're going to have more chances. This is not a one-time deal. Make sure you're shooting the ones you want and not and don't give up on your hunt and just shoot a constellation buck. That's one thing I'd tell myself. And another thing, um, I don't even know, that's something that I feel like I need to say that's not even really related to mule deer, but I think relationships are more important 
than anything uh, in the hunting world, your hunting partners, your hunting friends, people you rely on, maybe it's a manufacturer, maybe it's somebody that provides a service, maybe it's a guy that runs a podcast, maybe it's just some guy that likes to hunt mule deer. Something I've learned the older I get, and it's very important, I see it day in and day out, especially on social media, is man, do everything you can to nurture relationships and stay, be a true friend to other people and and uh do the things you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do them i know that sounds awful preachy but man it's so easy to get caught up in the day-to-day and go man i want mine i'm going to do whatever it takes to get mine and i'm going to move forward i'd really like to do this for you but it might get in the way of doing something for myself and uh you, you really shouldn't you really shouldn't be that way you should really really do everything you can to serve others and help others and maintain those relationships especially in the hunting world because that guy that's that guy that's you're you're helping today, man, it's gonna come full circle. He's probably gonna help you down the road. And that's something I would have told myself a long time ago too. No, that's I mean definitely something very important to remember that it doesn't just relate to hunting mule deer, doesn't just relate to hunting in general. It's just one of those things that's important in life that I think we all forget, but um, no, those relationships are, are very important. And, um, you know, I think honestly, I, that's one of the reasons why I love hunt expo so much. It's like, uh, I get to see all those people, uh, in one place that I've developed all those relationships with, <laughs> uh, it's like the big family reunion. I was just yeah. telling someone. Yeah, it is like a family reunion. Just be the friend, be the friend to them that you want them to be to you. You know, it's a simple golden rule you learned in first grade do unto others as you have them do unto you all this stuff you know we get on these podcasts to talk about hunting shooting animals and, and all that but those things are important but it's it's those things aren't important to me <laughs> at this age at this stage in the game is as those core values of don't don't nurture relationships nurture the friendships they got you to where you're at and and the the people listening to the hunting podcast are passionate people that are, they are, they are networkers. They're people using relationships to get ahead. They're being used by people to get ahead. And I'm not saying used in a bad term. I'm saying we're all using each other to build our platforms. The one thing I'll tell everybody is there is room for all of us. There's room for everybody. You, so this brand and this person doesn't have to fail for this person to be successful. Muley Slayer doesn't have to step on this guy to, to get ahead and to, to have his place, to have his piece of the pie. Guess what? There's enough pie that everyone can have their triangle. And, and, and the hunting industry is, the, is one of the worst. It's just such a small community. And once you burn a bridge, man, it's so hard to come back and, and fix that bridge or to rebuild that bridge. And so most of the time it's impossible to rebuild a bridge, but there's enough room in the world to have a Hoyt and a PSC and a Matthews and a Muley Slayer and a Marlon Holden and a Trevin Stolzfitz. And man, any of those guys will tell you, just like I'm telling you now, I know all of them. We've all grown up together. We've all come full circle and we've all been used and we've all been users. And the best thing to do is just return the favor the way it's been given to you. Someone gives you an opportunity, hand that opportunity off to the next guy. And when it comes full circle and it's time to do something for that guy, go do it for him back. And, and that's, it, it, and that's so important. And if we can all stick to that, life's going to be beautiful. But if you try to get outside of that, you try to get ahead and you know, the, the rungs of success are not up the backs of others. You have got to climb your own ladder to the top because mm-hmm. there's room for everybody's ladder. Awful preachy, awful preachy, I hey. know, but it's something that's very important to me. And it's something that I see all the time. And, and I just, for the younger guys, there's a lot of really cool, fit young guys out there really hustling. And I can see them hustling and I can just, I can just feel it. I'm just like, hey, I want to say this to you because you need to hear it because <laughs> I've been right where you're at. But there's room for you, man. Just know there's room for you in this pie. No, I think, you know, it's. I, I've had a few people reach out to me, um, you know, some some younger guys and just some random random people. Um, you know, I've had them reach out and they they've they've asked basically along the lines of you know, well, how do I make it in the hunting industry? Which I after I stop laughing for you know um, 
I, and, and wipe wipe my eyes from the <laughs> tears the fact that they're asking me that um I, you know i i know people that uh, you know have have decades of of time on me and and hundreds of animals under their belt and and partnerships with just about every every company you'd want in the industry and they wouldn't even consider themselves as having made it in the hunting industry yet um you know so i i laugh when people ask me that question cuz i just i'm just some rookie kid from los angeles that uh wants to try and shoot an elk but um you know i always tell him the the few things i always tell him i'm like well you know i don't know how to make it but how i've gotten to where i'm at is i don't i don't chase things you know i'm not i'm not trying to i'm not sitting here with my instagram profile uh, for the sole purpose of trying to find a sponsor to get get free stuff. I mean, once again, don't get me wrong. Somebody uh, calls me up and says, Hey, we want to send you this pair of boots or this knife. I'm going to say, Oh, that's awesome. Okay. As provided it's something I'd want to use. Yep. But I tell them, I'm like, don't, don't chase sponsors. Don't chase free stuff. You know, just post what you love, do what you love doing and, and be very genuine about it. And then two, when develop relationships, uh, you know, just like what we were talking about, I'm like develop those relationships, but don't develop them from the perspective of, oh man, this person's, you know, uh, got an awesome following. What can they do for me? Just, you know, develop these relationships because you're genuinely interested in the people. Everything else follows. You know, it's one of those things, um, yeah. Gosh, I, it reminds me of this terrible B movie uh, um, called The Tao of Steve that I probably shouldn't reference because it's pretty bad. But I'll I'll move past that one. But basically, you know, if if you want to be successful in the hunting industry, you have to rid yourself of a desire to be successful in the hunting industry. Um, the, yes, I, amen, amen to that, brother. The people here, That's perfect. You just worded that absolutely uh, perfect. It's. It's the people, the people that you really want to know in this industry are entirely too discerning and genuine to ever be fooled by, you know, a bunch of BS, you know, a, a, someone pretending to, uh, you know, pretending to just want to be their friend or just, you know, want to hunt, you know, they're going to see through those motives really quick, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Maybe I give people too much credit, but just from the people I've seen and gotten to know, um, you know, they could pick a phony out from a mile away. Um, and so I just, I, I remind people, you know, I've had kids that ask me, um, and I told them, I'm like, well, first of all, remove, remove the phrase sponsors, email me here <laughs> or yeah. now, now seeking sponsors, I'm like, well, first thing you need to do is take that out of your Instagram profile because that's just embarrassing. <laughs> um, yeah. And, yeah, it's a it's a weird thing, man. You know, a lot of people I know I've gotten a lot of I've gotten a lot of crap because people think that's what I'm chasing or I don't I don't know what people think. I don't really care all that much. You know, there's there's very. I, I care about the opinions of people that I respect and I, you know, there's a lot of people in this industry that I respect and everyone else, you know what, you know, I don't like being disliked, but uh, you know, it's, it's about as uncomfortable as a flea bite to me at this point. So, uh, yeah, sure. It's just comes, comes with the territory that the, the spot we put ourselves in, it just kind of comes with it. But all this stems back to the question, you know, and as you made some great points too on, on all of those things. I love what you said there about, uh, you know, taking that, just take that out of the equation. Don't first thing is first things first. Don't seek, just be sought, go be genuine and then be sought after. And that's, that goes, those are the two things, that, you know, number one, learn how to pass up bucks that aren't exactly what you want. The season only comes around once a year. You're going to get your opportunities. Number two, nurture relationships in the hunting industry. So I'm giving you two pieces of advice, one for mule deer hunting and one for just general life. But they're both, I think they're both things that I would have told myself 48 year old Mark talking to 24 year old Mark. Those are two things I would have said. 
No, that's that's fantastic. And you know that it, typically at this point of the podcast, I'd be like, well, you know, so what's your, uh, you know, I guess I can still ask the question. It's it's phrased a little bit differently, so you may have uh, some different thoughts on it. But you know, if somebody came up to you and said, you know, hey, Mark. Uh, you know, I've been following you, you know, I've been listening to you on podcasts, whatever it is. I, I really think what you do is awesome. I'm really interested in hunting and the outdoors, but I just don't have the, the background, you know, to get into it, or there's just so much to learn. I'm too intimidated, you know, whatever that is, I, you know, I don't have the resources. What would you, what would you tell that person? What, uh, words of wisdom would you give them? Uh, I just say you've already set way too many limits on yourself. You, by saying I don't have, I had nothing. When I say I had nothing, I mean, I had absolutely nothing when I started and all I did was believed in myself. I be, I believed, I just, that's all I had. All I had was my confidence, but I got married at very, very young. And my wife is my biggest fan. We've been married 30 years. We got married the summer. We graduated high school at 18 years old. So I've had somebody behind me um, the whole time that believed in me. And then when I would get down, she's my support system. She would say, you are, you are absolutely incredible. You are absolutely this or that. And sometimes I think you're just telling me what I want to hear. You're full <laughs> of crap. And then I go achieve, and then I go achieve a goal and I go, she's right. I am incredible. And it's okay. It's okay to say that. Set a goal for yourself, go achieve that goal. And it's okay to look in the mirror and say, you're incredible. You're a good person. You, you work hard. You did it right. I'd say, don't cut any corners. If you want to get in, if you want to be, let's say you just want to be the pronghorn slayer. <laughs> Some guy lives in Wyoming and he doesn't want to climb mountains. He just wants to, he wants to, my friend, Jace Bowserman, he's, he's been my friend for a long time. He is truly the antelope slayer, but he's killed more pronghorn with a bow than anybody. I know all of them, Pope and young, all on public land. The guy's is incredible. Jeez. And, uh, he's a editor. He's a editor, a publisher, editor over there at bow hunting world. And man, he came up, he was a school teacher and he was a writer. He's, he's just one of my friends. We've hunted lots of stuff together. I'm looking at a turkey. I killed with him right now. And, uh, but he, 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 he asked me that. I said, just go do, just do you, man. Just go do what you want to do. Just don't be me. There's already a me. Don't be a Randy Omer. There's already him. Don't be Cam. Cam's already Cam. He already did his thing. Just go be you. The guy just published his first book on, on pronghorn, the Prince of the Prairie. You know, he wrote his, a book about uh, pronghorn hunting, and he, he achieved it. He is him. He loves whitetail hunting. He loves mule deer hunting, but he is the pronghorn guy. Go, find what you love and just go do that and get sound. Be, just go get good at what you like to do, whether it's bass fishing, crappie fishing, jug lining for catfish, shooting partridge, car, I don't care what it is, whatever it is you want to do, golf, whatever. Just don't set out to beat anybody else. That was the one thing I had to learn in archery. I'd show up to a tournament and try to see who I needed to beat today. Who would <laughs> I beat today? Is it going to be this guy or this guy? No, no, no. That's... That's absolutely the wrong mentality because as soon as you get down and score a little bit and they're up a little bit, you've already, you've already defeated yourself in your mind because you're looking at the scorecards and then you're defeated. Archery is not a contact sport. However, you're shooting your bow today has no bearing on how I'm shooting my bow today. I'm, I just want to know what the course record is and where's target number one. That's all I need to know. And I'm going to go try to beat that. That is it. I'm going to shoot the very best arrow I can shoot out of my bow. If it's a 3d tournament, I just need to go shoot 40 perfect arrows and let the score end up where it is. And it doesn't matter what John Jones or Sam Smith score is. It doesn't matter. I just need to go do my thing the best that I can. And then that means some days I win and some days I don't win. But on the days I don't win, I learn. I never lose. Either I win or I learn. That's my, been my philosophy since before that was even a catchphrase. I never thought of myself as a loser. I never thought I lost. I just figured, hey, you know, I went to three state indoor championships before I ever won one. I went to one in the middle, middle of the pack. Next time I was number five, the next time I was number two, the next time I was number one. I just, what do I got to learn to be number one? I just wear not what anybody else did to me, 
I can't, I can't focus on that negativity. People don't have any other effect on me. What do I need to do to get to number one? And I did that. I learned those things and I did it. And I had a good support system from my wife pushing me the whole time, making me believe in myself, telling me, Hey, you are good. You are going to be there someday. And that, I think that's the most important thing is having a family behind me that believed in me. But I just say, whatever you want to go do, go do it. And when you're good at it, you'll never know you're good at it until other people tell you. I did not even think. I never once thought I was a very good mule deer hunter. I thought I was a, I thought I was a passionate mule deer hunter that had celebrated mediocrity to its fullest. Like I had done the best I could. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, people are wanting to fly me to places to talk about mule deer hunting or they're wanting me to write specific, giving me specific articles, you know, writing assignments that they're going to pay me. I'm going to pay you $500 and I want these seven photos. And I want this many words. I'll give you $500 for that. Wow. Really me? Okay. Hey, we're going to fly you here and we want you to talk about this and, and we're going to pay you this and we're going to set you up here and, and they pick you up and they treated you like Royal. They treat you really good. Like you're something, right? I never thought, I was anything until someone told me I was something, you know what I mean? And I'm like, huh. And everybody said, start an Instagram, start an Instagram. I, I don't even know what that is. Okay. <laughs> so four years ago, I, I you know, I, my Instagram's not in the hundred thousand. I don't even have 10,000 yet. I have 8,000 something. I'm very proud of my 8,000 followers because every one of them are genuine relationships that if you, if you, I'm just going to keep being me celebrating mediocrity to the fullest, and if that means you think I'm something, then awesome. But I'm going to keep being me. But if you hit me up privately, I'm going to answer you. If you say something nice to me on my Instagram, I'm going to hit that love button. I'm going to get. I'm going to acknowledge the fact that you spoke to me. So I don't need a hundred thousand followers to feel good about myself. I'm going to be genuine in the eight thousand that I have. And I think if that falls in line with the question, just go do you. Stay in your lane. That's one of my daughter. My daughter's got three kids. That's one of my favorite things I hear her say to her children. Stay in your lane. If one <laughs> wants to tattle on the other one, one wants the other one's toy, one wants something that the other one has, or, hey, stay in your lane. So bow hunters, archers, stay in your lane. Be you, do you, and someone someday is going to call you up and say, hey, can you come be on my podcast? Hey, can you fly out to Minneapolis and put on a seminar for 500 bow hunters for me? I want, I want you to talk about mule deer hunting. It's the most rewarding thing, but don't let it go to your head. Just go do you and do it right. Don't cut corners. Don't cheat. Don't poach. Be straight. If you shoot it behind a fence, say you shot it behind a fence. If you shot it on a feeder, say that. And I shot this buck off my feeder the other day. I see so many people want you to believe something's not genuine. That's the, that's the biggest flaw. Just be genuine. Whatever you do, just say that's what you did. And people will respect you a lot more for it. No, it's, there's something you said in there that it, it made me think, you know, about how we can change our focus. And, you know, as you're, as you're getting into this, as, you know, you're figuring out the kind of hunter you want to be, I think we need to focus less on striving necessarily to be good hunters and successful hunters and I think we just need to focus more on being passionate hunters. Um, if if that is our goal at any given time, uh, I think everything else, the becoming a good hunter, becoming a successful hunter, ends up developing. And I think you learn to enjoy things a lot more along the way, and you, you find more successes in the small things. Um, so, you know, it may call it, call it a, uh, uh, just a, a matter of, of phrasing, if you will. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, you focus more on being a passionate hunter and less on being a, a good hunter or a successful hunter or important hunter. Uh, things will, things will all kind of come together like they should. Yeah, absolutely. So, huh, Wow. That was a really good chat. Um, if people wanted to find you on uh, the interwebs, uh, you mentioned it at the beginning of the podcast, but uh, where can they hunt you down? Well, I have a Facebook called just called Muley Slayer. Uh, I, I will interact on there. 
but you know, since they started charging for ads, if it's a page, I don't do a whole lot on there anymore, but I still put updates every once in a while, but you can reach me on Muley Slayer on Facebook, but my number one place to hang out and uh, where I have my, the, mo- the most fun is over at Instagram and I'm Muley Slayer one on Instagram. That's, that's primarily, and I have a YouTube channel and I'm, I, I keep it, I do a lot of reviews and hunting stories and things on there. I don't, I don't really film my hunts, but I do have a YouTube channel. And I think it's just under Mark Smith. If you just do Google. If you just put Mark Smith bow hunting or Mark Smith with a C, uh, Weatherby, I've got a lot of Weatherby review. If you're a gun guy and you want to talk, look at Weatherby stuff, I have some stuff on there. But I have a, um, I have a series called Tales of the Hunt, and I like to take my mounts down and single them out and tell the hunting story of how I harvested that animal, what lesson I learned. I've only done like two or three of them, but I'm going to start doing those again this winter. Now i got a little better camera. It's nothing professional. I just sit there and talk about the mount, and I talk about the lessons learned on the hunt, and uh, those those seem to get a lot of likes. So, Mark Smith on YouTube, Muley Slayer One on Instagram, and Muley Slayer on Facebook is where folks can find me. Fantastic, and I'll make sure to link to all of those on the show notes page. Uh, that's going to be livingcountryinthecity.com slash eighty nine. Um. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to uh, sit down and chat. I had a fantastic time. I kept, we talked a little bit during the break and I kept finding myself just getting interested in what you're saying and forgetting that I was going to need to ask some questions. (laughs) (laughs) I guess that's successful. There we go. But thanks again so much for hopping on, Mark. Hey, no problem. I really enjoyed it and, uh, have me back whenever you, whenever you're ready to circle back for 2.0, let's do it. I definitely will. All right, y'all, that'll do it for episode 89 of Living Country in the City. Make sure y'all check out the show notes page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash 89 and get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. But until next time, keep it country, y'all. Thank y'all for listening to Living Country in the City. Get show notes and check out the blog, product reviews, events, and more at livingcountryinthecity.com. 